Good morning. Good morning. Let's bow our heads and have prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will give me strength, that you will give me the words to speak, that you will clear my mind and my thoughts, that what we talk about here, what we look into the scripture, Lord, that the words will be from you. Father, as we look at this gospel message, Father, I pray that we will see Jesus and him crucified. For this I ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you guys deal with anxiety? How many of you guys ever have anxiety attacks? I'm having one now, so you need to give me a second. That's probably never seen this before. This is one of the reasons why I need to step down and that you guys need new leadership. Please keep me in prayer as we go to this message. Turn with me to Romans chapter 3. We have looked at chapter 2. We started with chapter 3 last week. I want to read again what Paul has to say from verse 9 through verse 18. He goes, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under what? That they're all under sin. As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. Now, is he just talking about the heathen? Do you understand? This is us. It's all humanity. And you need to grasp this concept because this is how salvation comes to human beings. In Jesus' day, the biggest problem that he kept running into with the scribes and the Pharisees is they did not see their need for him. They wanted a Messiah, but they wanted a Messiah who would drive the Romans out and bring Israel back to prominence within the nations of the world. That was the Messiah they were looking for. And when Jesus came on the scene and showed a suffering Messiah, a Messiah that taught that you need to die to self, a Messiah that taught that you cannot produce righteousness within yourself, they said, we want another one. We do not want this man to rule over us. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, this foundation that has been laid from chapters 1 to this part of chapter 3, Paul spends all this time to get us to understand what the human condition is. Do you know why he spends so much time? It's because the human mind, or heart, as the Bible says, is deceitful. Above all things. Who can know it? We lie to ourselves. We deceive ourselves. We think that we're in a position with God that is good. When actually we are wretched and poor and blind and naked. And Paul wants you to see that. Why? Because when you understand Christ and when you see Him lifted up on that cross... And what it cost him to secure our salvation, then it should drive away all pride. It should drive away all judgment. And it should just bring humility. The deepest, most heartfelt humility that we see ourselves in the correct light. Do you know what that light is? Oh, what do you think, Rick? The it's all in your face. In Christ, in the light of Christ. So listen, in Christ, I have gained something from God that I could never gain 
in and of myself. Do you know what that is? It's his righteousness. Amen. Right? Isn't that what we need to be able to stand before a holy God? Righteousness? We look at the law, and the law is righteous. The law is holy. The law is just, and the law is good. The problem is, is the law can't give me righteousness. The only thing the law can do is condemn me. The law says to me, you have not loved God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, and all of your strength. And neither have you loved your neighbor as yourself. And I say, but that's what I want. And my flesh says, just try harder. And God says, that will never work. So the law, as we've been taught in our Sabbath school class, is a mirror. A mirror to show us the holiness, the righteousness, the character of God, and to reflect what and who I am outside of Jesus Christ. And that is a sinner in need of grace. A sinner in need of a righteousness that I can't produce. Amen. So Paul goes on from verses 10 to 18. And it says, listen, I love this. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of abs is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Now, did Paul find this out to be a reality in his life with the party of the circumcision who always came to where he was preaching and raising up churches? Were they swift to shed blood? Yeah. Did they have poison in their lips? Were they like serpents that just harassed him and followed him around? So listen. I love how Paul makes his case. Verse 19 says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are, what's that next word? It's actually a bad translation, that word under. should be in, or in the sphere of the law. Or here's a legal word, the jurisdiction of the law. Okay? Whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the jurisdiction of the law. Now who is under the jurisdiction of the law? What did you say, Ricky? World. The entire world, right? This is why Paul makes this case, that whether you're a heathen, or whether you're a, in his day, a religious Jew, all were under the conviction of the law. Because what does the law do? The law shows us the purity and the holiness of our God. Listen, this is the difference between us in a sinful nature <coughs> and those who have come to see Christ by being born again. Those under sin look at the law, and it is a terrible thing. Why? Because all it brings is condemnation and judgment. Those who know Christ are able to see the law for what it really is, a transcription of the character and the nature of God. God will never have another God before him, because if he did, he wouldn't be what? Okay? God will not share his authority and his power with anybody else, because if he did, he wouldn't be what? God will never lie to you. God will never murder you. God will never steal from you. God will never covet what you have. Do you understand the holiness and the beauty of the God you serve? Now, from our perspective, we look and go... That's the bar. And that's what we're called to. Okay? God has never changed from the creation and the forming of Adam with his own hands and breathing life into his nostrils. When Adam awoke and gained consciousness, what did God require from him? Complete and perfect perfection. Right? Do you know why? Complete and perfect perfection? Because if God made him imperfect, then God would be a perfect God. Amen. This is why we don't believe in evolution. Right? Amen. God made Adam 
perfect. God created this world in six days, and what he created was very good. It was perfect because we serve a God of perfection. That is not a scary thing. That is a good thing. Are you tired of living in an imperfect world? Yeah. Don't you long for a perfect world? So that has not changed. And God's requirements have not changed. God still requires from all His creation perfection. The problem is, we're not perfect, are we? Do you understand what Jesus Christ has done for you? Absolutely. Let's, let's look further on into Romans. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are in the law or under its jurisdiction, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the, what's that next word? World. This is why I'm telling you that all the world, the entire world, is under the jurisdiction of God's law. That all the world may become what? Does that scare you, that all the world may become guilty before God? That's actually a beautiful sentence. Because when you understand it, God has placed, and I said this before, God has placed us all in the same boat. So that He can save us all the same way. This is why there is one name given unto men whereby they can be saved. And that name is the name of Jesus Christ. You've heard many people say, well, you know, there's many roads that lead to heaven. No, there's one. And that road is Jesus Christ. And Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And it didn't stop there. He said plainly, no man comes to the Father except And the reason is, is because you have sin on you and you cannot stand in the presence of a holy God with sin and not be consumed. So the only way is through Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to think about what I just said. This is where Protestantism leaves us. They said, yes, come to God through Christ. But we're telling you that you don't have to stay in sin. You don't hear that very often from other Protestant churches. That in Christ, He not only came to save you, but He also came to change you. Now, is that good news? Yes. Now think about this, because most of us say, I don't want to go to that part. I like the fact that Jesus is going to save me, and I really want that. But this fact of having to live this life and, and, and having actual victory over sin, that's, I don't know about that. Do you want to stay in this condition? Do you want to stay a slave to sin? Because this is what this is about. You're going to be a slave to only two powers, and it's your choice. Either you choose Christ, or the choice is made for you, right? Amen. It's Christ or the devil. Now, can Christ give you power in your life? Yes. That takes faith. Yes. Listen, did, did, did Jesus say, you have to have the faith of the great pumpkin? No. The size of a great pumpkin? You know the great pumpkin? Things like yeah. 300 pounds? Or did he say the faith of a mustard seed? How big is a mustard seed? Small as a mustard seed. Okay, tiny. But what does that seed grow into? So with faith, it's like your muscles. It has to be used. Because if you don't use your muscles, what happens to them? And thank you for using that word. Did you hear what he said? Say it loud. Atrophy. Yeah, what does it mean? They get weak and they'll die. And they shrink. If your faith is not exercised, it will do the same thing. Okay? Jesus said, O oh, ye of what? Little, little faith. He doesn't want you to stay in that same condition. Christ wants to live in you, and he wants to work through you, and he wants to give you a hope. Amen. He wants to give you a power that this world cannot give. But you have to actually believe and exercise and walk out in faith.
What the verse before us really says is, now we know that what the things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are in the law, or within the sphere or jurisdiction of the law. This is an obvious fact, and in view of what immediately follows, it is very important to keep this fact in mind. The voice of the law, listen to this, the voice of the law, what law are we talking about? The Ten Commandments, right? The voice of the Ten Commandments is the voice of God. And if you hear that and understand that, it gives you a whole new way to look at the law. Who was it that actually proclaimed the Ten Commandments to the children of Israel? Was it Moses? No. It was God Himself, right? So do you understand that the voice of the law is the voice of God. <clears throat> the law is the truth because it was spoken with God's own voice. In the covenant which God made with the Jews concerning the Ten Commandments, He said of the law in Exodus 19.5, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice. The commandments were spoken. Deuteronomy 5.22 says, In the mount, out of the midst of the fire, of the cloud, and of the thick darkness, with a great voice. Therefore, when the law of God speaks to a man, we say, well, that's your conscience telling you right from wrong. When the law of God speaks to you, it's actually the very voice of God. Amen? Amen. Do you understand that? Let's say that you've worked a 12-hour shift and you haven't had a break yet. And you're starting for you. <laughs> and you're starting. And you go into the company refrigerator, and you didn't bring nothing, but there's all kind of food in there. And you open that door, and there is your favorite sandwich that belongs to Bob. Bob, your co-worker. Bob's not going to be in the refrigerator and in that kitchen for another hour. So Bob will never know what happened to his sandwich. So you're thinking, Man, I'm really hungry, and that sandwich looks really good. But still, that's there's that voice inside your head going, no, you know that that's not yours, and it's wrong to take that. What is that voice? We say that's our conscience. Do you realize that's the voice of God? That is the Holy Spirit talking to you, working in your heart and in your life. Have you ever thought about that? You're driving down the road, Ray, and, 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 and that guy just cut you off. And he could have killed not only himself, you're in a big truck, so usually it's not as bad for you, but he could have killed three or four of the cars around you. And you get really upset. And you really want to do something to that guy, or at least give him a sign. <laughs> <laughs> but you say to yourself, no. Christ has told me that... You know, I am to love my enemies. And you say, I'm just going to allow the Holy Spirit to calm me down. Who is that doing that for you? That is the voice of God. Think about that. Because if you... If you have these things going on in your head... And sometimes they can drive you crazy. And you're wondering, does God love me? Is God with me? How do I actually... I know, and I've heard, and I've read about overcoming sin, but when a temptation comes and I don't do it, what happens then? Does God cast me out? This is where you need to understand who and what you are in Christ. You also need to realize that God is trying to get you to understand that you do not have to fall to sin because that's what the Word says, right? There is no temptation, right? And, and, and that word, no, is pretty, pretty narrow, isn't it? I mean, he didn't give you any caveats. But listen, our God is a patient, long-suffering God. Why is He so patient and long-suffering? The Bible says because He doesn't want 
any to perish, but he wants all to come to everlasting life, right? Amen. So listen, so God is continuously working with you. I, got, I received a book two weeks ago from two initials, the last name is Prescott. Right. Oh, the, the, the author of the book. The author of the book. Yeah, that's the, guy, the guy's name is Ray. Uh, Prescott. I think Prescott was a leader. Early 1900s. Yeah. Yes, okay. He wrote in his book that the reason why God does not pour out his Holy Spirit with power is because if the people are not ready for it, it will kill them. Wow. Kind of read that like a bunch of, bunch of, bunch of times. And, and, and when I first read it, it's like, yeah, I understand this, but I need to understand what, why is he saying this and what's the context and, and the depth of what he means. And you need to realize, we pray for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's not given. Do you know why? It's because if we're not ready for it, and God is to pour it out, can God and sin live in the same place? Yeah. Do you understand why it's so important that for that generation that's alive when Jesus comes back, that they actually take his promises as real, and that they actually submit themselves to him so that they live a life that he has already lived and wants to live through and in and with you. Christ hasn't come back because we're not at that stage yet. But God has raised up a church over a hundred and how many years? 170? He was ready to do this back in 1844, and then he was ready to do it again in 1888, and now we're in 2017, and I believe he's ready to do it again. But God will not pour out his Holy Spirit until his leaders, number one, are ready and submit themselves fully and completely to him, and then number two, are able to present a message that the people, and a vision that the people can grasp and see, and see that their leaders have a power that they've never seen before, and that power is the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, that is what you and I need. That's what God has called us for. Amen. You understand why the Bible says that, that we... We are just jars of clay. There are days when my faith in God is so strong and His power is so real. And then there are days, and it could be the same day, where it's like Peter and a, a, a little girl beside a fire, just totally destroyed. That's not what God has called us for. God did not call us to continue to ride that roller coaster. God has called us to live in His strength, live in His peace, and allow Him to dwell in us. What things soever the law says, it says to them who are within its sphere or jurisdiction. Why? As the scripture says, that every mouth may be stopped. And all the world may become guilty before God. How extensive then is the jurisdiction of the law? It includes every soul in the world. There is no one who is exempt from obedience to it. There is not a soul whom it does not declare to be guilty. That is what the law does for us. It declares us outside of Christ guilty. But do you understand when Jesus says you must be born again? And when you actually are born again, the difference that the law takes on, now what the law does is show you what real righteousness is, what Christ has called you to, and what you can actually attain and become. Listen, one of the saddest things in 55 years of living is knowing people from childhood to adulthood into my age who gave up growing and learning as a human being when they were like 19 or 20. You know those people? Yeah? You're not one of those anymore. 
No. Okay. I, I know those people that they've stopped growing as a person. And I want to continue to learn until the day I die. Amen. The world has a lot of stuff you can learn, and that's all it is, is stuff. What I want to learn is Christ, and I want to learn of His perfection, and I want to know Him and Him crucified. Amen. Because I want Him crucified in me so that it's no longer I, but it's Him that lives in me.
Verse 21. Open your Bible.